Hello, everyone, and welcome to KCB International and Friends webinar series, episode seven. Today's title is Rethinking International Arbitration Post COVID 19. Uh, the topic of COVID-19 and its impact on international arbitration has been a topic that was much discussed in many other webinars, uh, but it's endlessly varied. And for today's topic, we have Yulchun LLC and 39 Excess Chambers to provide their unique perspective on the impact of COVID-19 in international arbitration. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to make use of the question chat box and type in your questions. The speakers will endeavor to answer them during the panel or after the panel. Uh, before we start the webinar, let me call on Professor Hitek Shin, Chairman of KCB International, to give his welcome remarks. Professor Shin, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you, uh, Suhyun. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you at the seventh KCAB International and Friends webinar today. I appreciate your joining uh, in this webinar out of your busy schedule today. First of all, I would like to extend my special thanks to our colleagues, Mr. Stephen Lim, uh, Mr. Samak Abbas Me of Chambers, and Ms. Chunghe Sophie An, and Ms. Hyuna Park from Yulchon, for presenting this very timely and wonderful webinar in collaboration with KCAB International. As in other industries, the global pandemic forced the legal community to adapt to the new normal of a virtual world. History shows that human beings have survived to date thanks to their extraordinary capability to overcome unforeseen challenges by creatively adapting to the new environment imposed by extern externalities. International arbitration community has quickly responded to challenges caused by COVID-19 by transforming in-person services in case management, arbitration procedures, and hearings into either hybrid or fully virtual mode. Before the outbreak of COVID-19, the arbitration community had generally thought that hearings could only be held in person except for a preliminary hearing dealing with mundane procedural issues. Surprisingly, many in the arbitration community now realize that even the full-scale hearings could be conducted virtually if a proper and thoughtful preparation could be made with the support of an ever-improving technology used in line with a sophisticated protocol. Moreover, we at KCAB International find that virtual meetings and hearings have significantly enhanced the efficiency of international arbitration procedure and reduced cost of international arbitration by eliminating time and expenses to be incurred by the in-person hearings. From the standpoint of international arbitration community, it is timely to understand and hopefully attempt to design what the most optimal dispute resolution procedure or frame could be when we go back to our normal operational mode after overcoming the current crisis triggered by virus. With this broad picture in mind, today's webinar will focus on the major changes in international arbitration scene and practice in the post-pandemic era from various angles. Since the pandemic broke out early this year, 
KCAB International has responded to the challenges quite effectively by promptly embracing new ideas and procedures supported by technologies. Our quick switch tool for virtual friendly settings has been supported by the two pillars, Seoul International Dispute Resolution Center, Seoul IDRC, and the Seoul Protocol on Video Conferencing in International Arbitration. As you know, Seoul IDRC, which is a dedicated hearing center run by KCAB, provides the state-of-art facilities for cases administered by KCAB International, as well as reputable foreign arbitral institutions such as ICC and SEAT and Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. Seoul IDRC now offers both virtual and hybrid hearing services as an alternative to in-person hearings. Statistically, the number of cases using virtual hearings has increased by more than 450% this year as compared to that in previous years before the pandemic. The Seoul Protocol on Video Conferencing in International Arbitration, which was first announced publicly at the occasion of the seventh annual ADR conference in 2018, is a guide consisting of nine articles on planning, testing, and conducting video conferences in international arbitration. At the time of its announcement in 2018, we never thought about the pandemic, uh, but we anticipated the need, growing need to have a protocol which would guide us in preparing for the video conferencing. The Seoul protocol and its growing applicability in the post-pandemic area era will be further discussed in the ninth Asia Pacific ADR conference webinar which is a flagship event of the Seoul ADR Festival 2020. It will be held next week. The Asia Pacific ADR Conference in particular is scheduled to take place on November 5th and 6th, uh, the Thursday and Friday next week. The A Asia Pacific ADR Conference uh, I would like to invite all of you to join this conference in the upcoming event, many events, and share your thoughts and opinions uh, during the conference. I hope that you find today's webinar informative and useful in understanding the newly developing practice in international arbitration. The speakers of today's seminar are among the most experienced and recognize arbitration practitioners in the region from the reputable 39 SX chambers and the law firm of Yulchon. Recently, we hear scary news that in some countries in Europe and America, the number of newly infected are resurging. I hope all of you, your families and colleagues stay safe and healthy in these turbulent times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shen, for those remarks. Uh, we are ready to start our webinar. As I mentioned, the, top, the title of today's webinar is Rethinking International Arbitration Post-COVID-19. And we have our friends from Yulchon LLC and 39 SS Chamber of Singapore to share their views on this topic. Today's webinar will be in a a panelist uh, interactive uh, form and uh, the leader of the discussion or the moderator of the discussion will be Stephen Lee from 39 Essex Chambers. Uh, Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sue, for the introduction and thank you also to uh, Professor Shin uh, for those kind introductory remarks. Uh, at this time, I, can I ask my fellow panelists, uh, Sophie, Huna, and Samar, to also turn on their videos, please? 
right? As, as Sue mentioned, uh, we are going to uh, conduct this webinar uh, in an interactive format. We'll be holding a discussion uh, around uh, the theme of rethinking international arbitration post COVID-19. Before I, I go in further to introduce the topic, let me introduce the, my fellow panelists. Um, we have with us Sophie Ahn from Yuchun. Sophie is a partner with Yuchun, and she will bring to this discussion the perspective of a civil lawyer with extensive experience of international arbitration. And in fact, the, the idea for this particular topic for this webinar uh, arose in a conversation I had with Sophie when I was talking to Sophie about how I, uh, as a common law trained lawyer, found the utility of using inquisitorial processes in international arbitration. Uh, and she somewhat surprised me when she said that that might take even civil lawyers by surprise. Not the fact that I'm a common lawyer doing it, but that we want to use inquisitorial processes in international arbitration. Uh, and that set me thinking um, about, about this topic. And, and you know, that was a seed for, for conducting this webinar uh, with the 39 and, and, and Yuchun. We also have with us uh, Hyuna Park. Hyuna is also a partner with Yuchun. She's a Korean attorney. And she's actually taken the interestingly, slightly less trodden path of taking a master's degree in law in the UK. Uh, so she might understand a little bit about what Samar and I are about being barristers. <laughs> she has a lot of experience with international arbitration, uh, as well as Korean litigation, uh, and has a specialism in insurance disputes. And Hyuna brings uh, a civil law perspective, but also an understanding of common law approaches. And then uh, last but not least is my colleague from 39 Essex in, in London, this time not in Singapore. Uh, Samar is a English barrister. He focuses on construction and infrastructure disputes. And Samar has worked in international arbitration since starting practice. I know this because I first met Samar before I joined 39. He appeared before me as part of the council team in a matter in which I was sitting as an arbitrator in an international arbitration in Singapore. So I've had the pleasure of knowing Samar for a long time, even though we've only been colleagues uh, in chambers for a shorter time. So as, as I said, we, we will not be each uh, presenting discrete presentations. We are going to engage in a roundtable discussion of themes flowing from the topic of this webinar. Uh, and it falls on me to introduce these themes. The, the themes flow from, from the title of the webinar and also from what you saw as the description. And I hope we, we haven't oversold that, but what we are gonna do in this, in this webinar is not talk about how we do virtual hearings in, in the midst of COVID-19. What we're trying to do in this webinar is to go beyond that and look about what opportunities these changes to practice bring about opportunities that might actually help us finally cut you know this this Gordian knot that that we've been talking about for years and years which is how international arbitration has become um, more lengthy and expensive uh, and you know, some there's been a comment made that uh, this seems to be a, a groundhog day topic we keep talking about it 10 years ago we spoke about it uh, and 10 years later we're still talking about it and what we're going to explore in this webinar is whether this use of technology, there is going to be one of those inflection points. Uh, it's going to be one of those game changers that would let us start breaking away from, from what we call a unitary procedural archetype for international arbitration. Uh, and that's one of the themes that, 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 that we're going to talk about. Although it, it could be a, a controversial topic, except that all my fellow panelists agree with me there's unitary procedural archetype. So, so we're not going to spend too much time debating it because we actually agree on it. Um, but some of the audience may not agree. And, and if, you, if you do not agree, you know, please do uh, make your views known uh, during the Q&A part of this, this webinar. But what do we mean by a unitary procedural archetype? Um, as Pro Professor Shin hinted uh, in his introduction, it, it's, it's somewhat... Uh, uh, has as its uh, an assumption, which is that you can't hold substantive hearings, you, you can't hold uh, substantive procedures in international arbitration, except uh, in person. And, and to some extent, 
Um, I agree with that. Uh, I agree that there is a lot of utility and value in having in-person interactive discussion with the parties. I think uh, a lot comes out of that, uh, as opposed to just having written exchanges with the parties. But what technology makes available is that it is not possible to have that kind of exchange uh, in the sort of, of virtual or remote te technological setting rather than to be there physically in person. And that's one of the issues we are going to discuss. But uh, what is this archetype? I think I should also press paint out a little bit further. What is this archetype that, that we say needs to be relooked at and needs to have some change? I mean, it, it begins, first of all, with a preliminary meeting that you know, most of us are familiar with, the preliminary meeting to settle procedural order number one. Um, quite often, um, as Professor Shin hinted as well, this is settled even without a meeting. It's settled sometimes by correspondence. Uh, if there's a meeting, perhaps it is by telephone conference. Um, and what that results in is, is sometimes there is little or no attempt to identify the issues of the case at that early stage. Uh, and there's consequent to that, there is no attempt to tailor the procedure of, of, of the case set out in procedural order number one to the circumstances of and the issues in the case. Uh, and what you end up with is a pretty standard procedure that is adopted in almost all cases with minor variations here and there. And it also seems to be the aim uh, or the practice is for, for that procedure to set out a procedure which primarily involves written exchanges of memorials or statements of case and witnesses statements where, where, where those are used over an extended period, you know, sometimes over the course of a year or more, uh, which then culminates in one single concentrated hearing at which the tribunal will hear the evidence and the party's legal arguments. And that's the one hearing that you have. And it could be, depending on the complexity of the case, a few days or sometimes even several weeks. Uh, and I, I, I think I'm going out on the limb here, but I think I've, I, I've got some, I found some backing in the introductory words of Professor Shin, which is that I think this practice may have developed, perhaps even subconsciously, uh, as to what I term the tyranny of distance in international arbitration. The tyranny of distance being that by its nature in international arbitration, the, the tribunal and the parties, the council it will come from different jurisdictions and it's difficult to come together and meet physically in one location. Uh, and and we all and we all recognize that as, as I've said, there was a belief that you know you, you there's only so much you could do outside of meeting physically, uh, and you couldn't really deal with anything substantive, uh, pro pro possibly some procedural issues, but you couldn't deal with anything substantive. Uh, and I think you know that had maybe sort of the underpinning to how we ended up with the situation. But you know, coming to to COVID nineteen and and the embrace of technology we have now suddenly gotten used to using technology to, to communicating remotely and to meeting remotely. And, I, and to some extent, I think you're meeting remotely quite effectively. And that then brings up the other themes that, that we're gonna be discussing, which is that with this possibility, it, it's now possible, I think we have the opportunity to start looking at what are the different procedures and pathways that we maybe adopt that may be more tailored to specific cases and parties. I mean, that in itself may be a controversial point that we, that we should have different procedures and pathways tailored to specific cases and, and parties. So that's where I'm going to invite Samar, Sophie and, and Huna uh, to talk to us about and we'll discuss. Um, part of that, and perhaps maybe even also a controversial point as well is that in designing these different procedures and pathways that you know, one of the objectives we might want to try and, and achieve is more active and frequent case management. Uh, we've been talking some time in the international arbitration community about having more case management. And one of the difficulties we have been really with more case management is that um, you know, you, we couldn't meet physically, but if we can now meet just as effectively in the sort of virtual platform, you know, does this open up the opportunity to us have to have more active and frequent case management. And so what, what is this going to look like? And this is another topic that we will discuss. And as part of that, very closely aligned to that is the issue of whether as part of that active case management, one of the things we should try and, 
and do is really to identify the issues in the case early and, and then track that through as the case progresses and whether this is going to help in, in introducing efficiency in the process. And of course, you know, that, that brings us on to one of the, the ideas that, that I, at least I've experimented with and one of the things I know that some uh, Sophie uh, and Huna and others may want to talk about, which is the use of inquisitorial processes in, in our international arbitration and, and how that might help create a more efficient process um, for international arbitration. So, so with that introduction, let us then move into the first topic that we are going to discuss. Uh, and that is the, the point that, you know, whether we should have different pathways and procedures tailored to specific cases. Uh, and you know, it does, uh, the embrace of this technology open this up. You know, do we now, are we now at the inflection point where we, with the use of technology, we can start looking at doing things differently? Uh, I'll ask uh, Sophie to lead us off uh, on this topic. I believe Shona will kick off this topic. Apologies, that's right. Hyuna, 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 Hyuna. That's Apologies. okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, I'll start the discussion uh, for topic number one, that is um, different pathways and procedures tailored to specific cases and, and parties. And um, I believe that the time has come for international arbitration practice to actually move away from a unitary archetype and develop um, different pathways and procedures tailored to a specific cases and parties. Uh, the frequent users of international arbitrations are already familiar with this um, current uh, procedure archetype that Stephen just described. And um, I have to admit that I myself as an international arbitration practitioner am also accustomed to this um, rather traditional procedure and um, often forget to explore the possibility of adopting different procedure which may be more suitable to certain cases and parties. And I think that's because um, there used to be some practical difficulties to try um, different procedures and parties or their council would just want to avoid unnecessary dispute over procedure which is already kind of established before the real battle begins uh, on the merits. However, it is also true that um, users from civil law countries often feel less comfortable with the current international arbitration procedure as it seems lean towards more to common law system than that of um, civil law system. For instance, uh, some Korean parties feel that it is very difficult to get a sense of the outcome in international arbitration because they don't get to be engaged with the tribunal until the very last step of uh, the lengthy process, and that is the, um, the oral hearing at the end. And that's usually when the parties and the council will be encountered with the tribunal for the first time and actually have the discussion on the substance of the case. Uh, to, uh, to make the comparison, uh, in the Korean court litigation proceedings, the court is actively involved with the case and the parties from the very beginning. And this gives more productivity and opportunities to the parties to prepare their cases. And I think this aspect of the civil law system is something that we need to consider adopting more and more in international arbitration. I'm not actually proposing that the whole uh, international arbitration procedure needs to be somehow replaced with or fundamentally changed into civil law procedure system, or that this new procedure should apply to all international arbitration cases. But um, now that this unexpected pandemic somehow fastens the use of advanced technology and enables us to try um, different procedures I think it's time for us to think outside of the box and uh, try to explore what would be the most appropriate and suitable procedure for each cases and for each parties. So that would be thank my discussion for topic number one. Thank, thank you very much. And I think you, you've raised some interesting points which, which we're trying to pick up later. 
um, which is the uh, the comfort that that civil law practitioners may or may not feel with, with the current procedure in international arbitration, uh, and also uh, the how the use of technology may enable us to to adopt more civil law procedures. I think that's something that we should definitely try and pick up um, later on. But be, before we do that, since we, we've had a bit of a civil law perspective on this. Um, let me call on, on Samar, uh, uh, the English barrister, uh, and see whether he wants to defend the bastion of the common law practice in international arbitration. Uh, th thank you, Stephen, and thank you everyone for, for joining. I think this is, this is traditionally the cue for the English barrister uh, to, to come in and say, well, listen, everything is everything that we do in the common law world is perfect and to that extent international arbitration is therefore also also fine and hunky-dory well listen um i agree with a lot of what's been said uh, but but i do have one um slightly different take on it and if we step back um, one of the reasons why sort of the current archetype has developed without there having been any compulsion for it to have developed in this particular way is that it works well enough, frequently enough, for a large enough number of parties. That is how it has developed. Now, as a common law practitioner, as someone who uh, has practiced in international arbitration, but also in, in courts in England, which is the archetype of the, uh, of the common, law, common law world, uh, you know, we do find that there are many aspects of international arbitration which, are, uh, which don't resonate with our system, uh, you know, for instance, the relegation of oral argument and the heavy deployment of written materials, it's something that is an anathema, certainly to, to those in my, in my part of the profession. But you say, well, the system has worked well enough for most of the time. So uh, as Stephen, you said, uh, every year, every two years, we have this debate and we move on because ultimately we move on because for the most part, it has been working. And so even though people, some people have been dissatisfied with certain aspects of it, where they say, well, you know what, on the whole, it's working, let's not change it. Now, uh, we do have a serious opportunity to have a critical look at which parts of this procedural archetype we can change and or tweak and to what extent. Um, I mean, for instance, uh, does a shareholder dispute between an Indian party and an American party deserve the same approach from PO1 all the way through to uh, an oral hearing at the end, then let's say uh, an infrastructure dispute involving a Korean contractor and an Arab employer. Uh, I, I think the obvious answer to me is it probably doesn't. And, and now we have the opportunity uh, to start thinking about, well, what, what are the things that we can, we can start changing? So, I'm open to discussion. I look forward to discussing this further on this on this uh, uh, webinar and and beyond. Thank you very much, Samar. Well, I think one of the points you make uh, might might be slightly contentious, which is that the current archetype, procedural archetype, works well enough for most of the cases, most of the time, and and that might might be a, a point that that is open to debate. I don't disagree that it, it does work some of the time, and I don't disagree that for some cases we should continue to 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 use that archetype. But the question, the the point that perhaps is, is slightly contentious is that it is it works most of the time for most of the cases. Uh, but we, we might come back to that if <laughs> I, I should be specific. I should be specific with the words, and I repeat the words I do use well enough, frequently enough, for large enough, not most of the people, a large <laughs> enough number of people. It works well enough for them that they say, well, you know what, we don't need to change it. But I, I agree, we do need to change it. Uh, but I'm just, I'm just giving an explanation as to why we haven't changed it so far. Thanks for that, Samar. So, so that, that's an example of the English barrister. I'll never let a point go if, if, if it can take it up. <laughs> uh, but let, let, let's move on, on to Sophie. Let's, let's get another uh, a civil law perspective on this. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Samar and Hyona, uh, for sharing your views. Uh, well, as for the change of the, the, our system, I would like to more focus on flexibility of arbitration. We always assert that a flexible procedure is one of the virtues of arbitration. Then what is a flexible procedure? 
It means that a procedure which can be tailored for specific cases and specific parties. Of course, the current archetype allows variation, but it allows only minor variations because the basic stru structure still remains. To be clear, as Samar said, the current archetype is a well-refined set of proceedings and we need not avoid opting the archetype or dramatically change it. Uh, in other words, the current archetype is an excellent and wonderful system which can serve uh, the best interest of many parties to arbitration. But we need to remember that there are parties or even council who are not familiar with the current archetype or who are reluctant to use it. As a lawyer practicing in a civil law country, I have ex experienced many parties who are not satisfied with the current archetype. Also, I have met many clients who are reluctant to go arbitration, particularly because they do not like the current archetype. Then there is no reason to refrain from developing a new set of proceedings to serve the best interest of these parties. We already have a good option, the current archetype, but it is always good to have more options we can select. The more options we have, the more people we can satisfy. Then what options we will adopt? Considering that the current archetype leans toward the common law system, I suggest we adopt a procedure where the elements of a civil law system or inquisitorial procedures are included. Again, okay? I'm not saying that we will replace the current archetype, but suggesting it should be good to have more options yeah, that will be my discussion for the topic one. Thank you, thank you, Sophie. Thank you for that. And uh, you know, your, what you said it ties in actually with, with our discussion, which I mentioned in my introduction, which was the seed uh, of the idea that we should we should do this webinar together. And then, I, you know, for that, I'm not going to let you off so easily. I'm going to ask you then um, to. And this is actually a good segue into the second uh, theme that we were going to talk about, which is the use of inquisitorial processes. I mean, you, uh, I heard you advocate that we should be using uh, some of this, and you know, and, and as I myself said, as a common lawyer, uh, I have have seen the advantage of using some some of this in in some cases. So, can you continue then and, and talk to us about your views on on use on the use of inquisitorial processes in international arbitration? Oh, sure. Well, as I said, I believe it is good to have more options and the use of inquisitorial procedures in international arbitration will give us more options. And I think the key is that the arbitrators play a more active role. Uh, under the current system, the arbitrators are just like umpires. They are not the players. But given the arbitrator's knowledge and experience in international arbitration, we do not have to waste their expertise. I would like to give you an example. Um, it was an international arbitration between a Korean company and an Indian company, and I was sitting as a sole arbitrator. After the case management conference, I issued uh, the procedure order number one, and I expected uh, one round of written submission followed by the document production, and then another round of written submission. But the problem was that both the parties and council were not familiar with such procedure, the current archetype. Not only the Korean party, but also the Indian party requested that the arbitrator, it's me, should play a more active role to manage the case. As a council, I have experienced only the current archetype and I am so accustomed to the current style as Hyona, like Hyona. Uh, so at first, I was almost irritated by the party's request. And when I was actively involved in the case, I felt almost guilty. But soon I found that the, the procedure, new procedure requested by the parties was quite efficient. For example, at the first CMC, the case management conference, the parties were not very actively involved in the discussion. However, after the CMC, the claimant amended its claim 
And then I found that the parties would have more and more new issues to discuss. Uh, we had two more CMCs to manage the case. And as a result, we could save time and cost to narrow down the issues uh, by narrowing down the issues. And as to the document production, the parties were almost hostile to the idea of a separate single document production procedure. So I used the element of inquisitorial system. And so according to that procedure, the parties could request documents from time to time to the arbitrator, not to the other party. And the arbitrator determined which document to be produced. And not only that, uh, the arbitrator can also order a party to produce certain documents, which is not requested by the other party. Uh, this means that the parties do not have to paint a complete big picture from the very early stage of the dispute. And the arbitrator does not have to wait until the hearing to request documents he or she deems necessary and to pose questions to the parties. Practically, this also means that the arbitrator should review all the written submissions and evidence immediately and spot the issues. Uh, well, frankly speaking, it was quite burdensome at first, but at the end of the procedure, I was happy that I already read all submissions and spotted all the issues. And at the hearing, I did not have to pose a lot of questions to the parties. And the parties did not waste their time and effort to develop and argue issues that the arbitrator do not think important. I'm not saying the use of inquisitorial procedure is always satisfactory to the parties or to the arbitrators. And I'm not saying that I'm always willing to use the inquisitorial procedures. But when both parties are not familiar with the current archetype, or when the parties wanted or needed more active involvement of the arbitrator, then the use of inquisitorial procedures can be a good option. Before I have experienced uh, the case I have just mentioned, I did not believe that other type of procedure can actually help the parties and can serve the best interest of parties. But after I experienced the, the system, I found that it's quite a good option, good option for some parties, for some cases. So that's my thought of about use of inquisitorial procedure. Thank you very much, Sophie, for that. And, uh, and, and that actually matches to some extent in my own experience with, with using inquisitorial processes. Uh, I got a little bit interested about it when I started talking uh, with someone who's a good friend of mine, uh, Professor Gary, Bo uh, Gary Bell, who teaches at the University in Singapore, uh, who is French Canadian, so has both common law and civil law background. And he told me about how he used civil law processes in some cases, particularly involving German parties and German council. And I thought it was very interesting how, how that worked. And I first used it actually in a KCAB case where I was appointed, where one party was unrepresented um, and the other party was represented, but you know, at council, I could tell, did not have much international arbitration experience. And one of the, uh, the things that it came to me at, at that time was that the archetype we've been talking about works well. You know, the archetype where you set up one procedure and then you let it run with minimal interference from the tribunal most of the time until you come to one final hearing works well where you've got participants involved who are familiar with the process, you know, who understand what you, they need to produce in the statements of case, in document production, et cetera. But when they don't, you know, one queries whether that, that, that is effective. And that was what compelled me to adopt an inquisitorial process. And I tried that out once and actually I tried it out again a second time uh, in an SIAC case um, that was actually governed by Singapore law, but I had two Korean law firms involved and they did not appear to me to be firms that were too familiar with international arbitration. And I proposed the inquisitorial process and they both agreed to that. And I think that worked out quite well as well. So you know, what, what you said, Sophia, I think really chimes in with, with my experience, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm an English barrister that, that sits pretty much in the civil law world in Asia. 
uh, and Asia is pretty much a civil law world. But let, let me turn to the English barrister that sits in London and, and get his reaction to the use of inquisitorial processes in, in, in Sure, I, 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 like, I like the prompt because this is again where I meant to jump in and say, well, no. Uh, no listen, um, the reality is that a lot of, a lot of what you've said, Stephen, and what, what Sophie said, I don't see these as necessarily or sort of definitional divide between the inquisitorial system and the common law system. Uh, you know, you often find eminent retired English judges who sit as arbitrators and they get frustrated with how little power they are in, a, in practice able to exercise compared to what they were used to in the English courts, which is again, as I said, the hallmark of the adversarial system. Um, but I was interested in something that Sophie said, which is, uh, you know, arbitrators and tribunals are often umpires and not players in the process. And I think what we really need to ask ourselves is, you know, what, why is that the case? Um, and a large part of the answer, again, I think, is parties um, often choose arbitration because the, the system that, that has developed over time, the, the system that is well known to the more sophisticated users of arbitration, uh, which, which is an adversarial process, uh, gives them more control over the proceedings and uh, how they manage their disputes. And uh, a lot of tribunals, a lot of arbitrators who uh, do this day in, day out, they are therefore reluctant to be too proactive because that is, that is what they used to expect, what they used to and what they used to expecting the parties to be used to. Um, and so it sort of snowballs uh, one into another. And so, as, as I said, you know, now that we do have an opportunity for change, I think it has to be a party-led process, a uh, council-led process. Uh, tribunals obviously need to support the process. Um, and, and I think a lot of, a lot of them, just as, as you said, with, from your own experience, and when you, you talk to people who sit as full-time arbitrators, which I don't, uh, uh, you, you'll, you'll find the tribunals will come on board but I do think that the change needs to be party-led and council-led. Um, of course, it is right that the earlier the tribunal reads in, the better. Um, you often find uh, these shocking examples of eminent tribunals not having read anything until, until the day before, you know, this unsealing their boxes the day before the, the first hearing. Obviously, it is right that the earlier they read in, the better, the more frequently they, uh, they engage with the issues, the better. Uh, but if, if I am expected by that to mean that I bless the inquisitorial system over the common law system, I, I don't think that is, that is the intention. And that's certainly not something that I think the common law system requires necessarily. I think we can have more uh, frequent hearings, more frequent CMCs, and a more active tribunal without giving the control away from the parties to the tribunal full stop. So that's my two cents. Thank you, Samar. Well, again, you, you, you raised some really interesting topics that perhaps if we have time, we, we can go back to it. Uh, one point in particular that, that interests me is you said that uh, a more, you know, having a more active tribunal is something that should be party-led and, and council-led. And, and I, I, I don't necessarily disagree with that to some extent in that uh, we should, the parties and the, and the council need to be comfortable with the process. But I do wonder sometimes whether you know, the, the parties and council do know um, when it is efficient and appropriate to have the tribunal involved. And one of the issues I, I find is sometimes um, the parties get, get dug into the case uh, and take, um, you know, reactive positions. Uh, and sometimes it does help to have a, the neutral third party look at it and say, you know, what, what, what is this going on, uh, uh, on about? But, I, you know, we, we can come back to that uh, a little later, if we can, but let's let's uh, get a perspective from Huna on this issue. Uh, you you need to unmute yourself, Huna. I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, thank you, Stephen. Um, well, personally, I do not have experience uh, acting as arbitrator yet, but um, I can understand that uh, the arbitrator might be reluctant to take. Um, a very proactive role, and that is because that's kind of against what the parties or the council um, expected. But um, 
I still think the tribunal should be encouraged uh, to involve more actively throughout the whole process. And inquisitorial procedure should also be used whenever it's um, appropriate or necessary. I mean, there can be cases where the parties do not have equal capacity to present their cases, and that might be necessary for the tribunal to take more active role in fact findings to eventually resolve the dispute in the um, arbitration proceedings. Or um, there even can be cases where uh, which have like multiple complex issues to be resolved and the tribunal may need to involve uh, with identifying and refining issues at early stage. And for this, I think the tribunal could utilize, as Sophie did, um, case management conferences and, and document production uh, process more actively. But um, the bottom line is that it does not uh, mean that the tribunal can actually take a side and help one party against the other. So the tribunal's role should strictly remain independent and impartial. Thank you for that contribution, uh, you know, well, that, well, that leads us very neatly into the, the, the next theme and, and that we were going to talk about, which is actually, I think, for, for the purposes of, of interest of time and also um, for uh, managing the discussion, we will take two of the themes that I mentioned together, one which is how technology and particularly web video conferencing opens up the possibility for having more active and frequent case management and is that a good thing and I, I heard you know, Huna uh, being in support of that uh, and also as part of that um, and we've begun to, to touch around this already in some of the comments that, that, that Samar and, and Sophie and, and Huna have made which is you know the, the ex how active should the tribunal be uh, and particularly focusing on, on dealing with the dispositive issues shaping helping the party shape the dispositive issues on the case. Um, just because the tribunal you know, works with the parties to shape the dispositive issues, I don't think means that the tribunal is actually taking any sides. And the tribunal is actually trying to identify with the parties what are the issues that the tribunal has to decide uh, to, de to determine the case. And, and I, I certainly take the view uh, as someone who, who sits much more these days than, than a peers counsel, that you know, after all, it is the tribunal that has to decide the issues. And the sooner the tribunal decide, well, it is the tribunal that has to decide the case. And the sooner the tribunal comes to grips with the issues that they have to decide, uh, that will lead them to decide the case. Uh, and the sooner the tribunal shapes the case that uh, to focus on that, you know, that the more we might end up with the more efficient process. But let's let's hear from from Samar first on, on this, and, and what what thoughts do you have on on more frequent case management or more active management of the case by the tribunal? Uh, the, the, the short answer, Stephen, is yes, I think it's a good idea. Now I'll give a slightly longer answer. Uh, if we go back to your introduction um, of the archetype which has developed, and I think uh, the four of us on the panel agree that there is, there is such a thing as the archetype that's developed, and uh, if attendees do not agree, they will let us know. Um, the expectation generally tends to be uh, that th there will be a, a hearing at the beginning and that may or may not happen in person or may or may not happen at all and then there will be a hearing all the way at the end uh, and you will have maybe a bifurcation so you'll have a partial award on on jurisdiction and then you may have uh, split liability and quantum and so maybe have those two partial awards maybe one cost at the end but those are the set stages uh, which have developed in people for good reason historically, as you said, Stephen, in the beginning, uh, because of the fear of travel and the fear of the costs of, uh, of getting everyone in the same room. We weren't doing this, the thinking part of the exercise, which is, are there any questions which can be resolved finally and dispositively now at the beginning? So I'm not just talking about case management for uh, you know, how do we get to the final hearing, I'm also talking management of the dispute as a whole to say, well, are there any bite-sized pieces that can be taken out? Um, certainly in the sort of work that I do, sort of large infrastructure cases, you often have seven or eight claims arising out of distinct contractual provisions, distinct parts of the process altogether involving different witnesses, involving different areas of expertise. Um, they all get lumped together 
at the end of a, a two, three year hearing. And the question that I want to pose, uh, and, I, and I, I, my answer is yes, is wh wh why, why can't we uh, say, well, if one part of the seven disputes can be resolved through an early hearing, finally and ultimately, what, why don't we do it? And, and uh, you know, we should be able to do it. And, and I think now that we uh, have the flexibility ingrained in our systems, in our minds, uh, that we can do actual hearings. We've all done them now. Uh, you know, we, we used to do the one odd witness uh, remotely, but now, you know, most of us who do this job day in, day out, you, you know, you've done chunky hearings, multi-day hearings on volume different time zones remotely. We know that that can work well enough. Then why do we wait all the way to the end of the three-year process to say, well, all these seven disputes need to be resolved at the end, if in fact, as a practical point, uh, you can resolve one or two of them earlier. And that can only happen, going back to the point that Sophie is making earlier, um, if the tribunal is involved and engaged uh, from an early stage, because th this is the kind of decision that everyone requires to uh, be uh, uh, involved in. So that's my, that's my two cents on that. Thank, thank you, Samar. I see you know, time, time has run on a lot faster than, uh, the, the, than I anticipated, as they say, you know, your time flies when you're having fun. But let's, let's hear final words from, from Sophie and then from Hina on, on this uh, before we go in and take some of the questions and answers that I see have been building up. Sophie? Okay. Um, uh, well, I also agree with the more active and effect, more active and more frequent case management from the early stage. And from my experience, it was uh, it was very helpful to be um, to take the procedure more efficient. And and I believe that more frequent case management is one of the element of inquisitorial procedure. And well. And it is, uh, and now that we have video conferencing facilities, it is more and it is easier to do more frequent case management and more active case management. Uh, in an arbitration case, I am currently handling the chair arbitrator is a civil law lawyer, and he loves Zoom. So we had lots of CMC. And I do not even remember how many CMC we had, but the result is that uh, we can very um, we can proceed with the procedure very efficiently after the, the CMCs. And the video conferencing does not cannot 100% replace in-person meeting, but it can replace the in-person meeting like 80 or 90%. And thanks to the video conferencing facilities, it's so easy to have CMC. So as Samar said, we do not have to take airplane or arrange a place or gather in that place. And all we have to do is just to contact the Zoom or WebEx or, or whatever. And, and I, what I believe is that uh, the, the video conferencing is even more convenient than a conference call, the tr traditional way uh, if we use video conferencing facilities, we can see each other's face and easily recognize who is talking. And also it is easier to concentrate on video conference than teleconference. And furthermore, most importantly, we can share documents or visual materials like slide, PowerPoint slide. And so I firmly believe that we should actively utilize the video conferencing facilities even after the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And that was my thought. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. And Huna, your thoughts? Yeah, um, basically I agree with um, Sophie's um, our remarks on the video conferencing. I think it has already been proven that it really works well, and it can even be a good substitute or alternative uh, for uh, in-person hearing and also for the um, very effective tool for um, 
early and active communication between amongst the parties and the tribunals. So that will definitely help us to uh, have more active and more frequent um, case management conferences. And as for the um, as, uh, early dialogue between the parties and the tribunal, I think uh, Samar gave a very good example of, of the case that needs an early dialogue uh, among the parties in the tribunal to um, to resolve the matter effectively. And I think, um, as I briefly explained, the Korean court litigation, we would normally have um, several hearings. And if it is especially like complex cases, then the court even holds a preparation hearing to identify issues at dispute and to discuss how the case should be handled before the, the main hearings. And as a result, the, the Korean parties will have better understanding of how the court actually sees the case. And that enables the parties to deal with any questions or doubts the court might have regarding their positions. And they might even have a better prospect of the outcome. And I think that's something that users of international arbitration will certainly enjoy and appreciate. So I, I believe that a more frequent and substantive dialogue amongst the parties and tribunal, especially on dispositive issues at early stage will definitely help not only the tribunal, but also the parties. So, and since it can be easily done via um, video conferencing, I think we should not be so afraid of um, such changes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fana. Well, well, it seems perhaps maybe not that surprising uh, that, that the four of us agree on quite a number of points. We agree that there is an archetype. We agree that we should, we should look at different pathways and procedures. Uh, we agree that the that, that use of web video conferencing you know, can be a tool for more effective and frequent case management. And we even agree, I think, to some extent, and even Sama agrees, that, that to some extent, you know, we, we can have the tribunal uh, more involved in, in, in refining and defining the dispositive issues of the case you know, early on in the process. Um, we even, I think, you know, well, well, I think so, certainly Sophie and Huna agree that we might want to adopt inappropriate cases, more inquisitorial processes, but I think even Sama is willing to accept you know, some aspect of that <laughs> in that. And that brings us, I think, to the end of, of what we can cover in, in this panel discussion. We clearly were not going to answer everything today, and clearly we, we, we didn't have the time or the scope to come up with what is, you know, the, the next best alternative. But the, the intention of this was really to start the discussion going uh, you know, with, with our audience and to see you know, what people thought about this and really to get people thinking about how we can start changing the way we do international arbitration for the better. And, and with that, I should turn this over to Sue, who will, will take uh, the questions and answers that have been coming in from the audience. I think Sue may be adjusting her camera. Okay, she's back. <laughs> yes. I am sorry about that. I didn't notice my camera had fallen off from my laptop. Um, well, anyways, thank you all for this very informative presentation. It was very interesting to hear all your very candid views about how much of the inquisitorial model we could actually implement in international arbitration. Um, I, I have a common law background, um, but I'm actually more used to, I mean, I have a civil law background, but I'm actually more used to the common law system that we all are, uh, we all often use, but it was interesting to hear all the discussion. And I'm very glad to say that we have uh, quite a number of questions. Um, I don't think we will go through every single one of them, but, um, I, and I noticed that some of them overlap, but just to start, I have um, actually have two questions for directly to Hyuna, and it relates to uh, the, the linguistorial model. And one comes from one of our attendees, Anna Guardia, and her question goes like this. Um, we'll just say then that the current trend in Korean arbitration 
participation is more common law oriented. And that's one question. And there's another question that's directly linked to it, and I think you can answer it together. Um, this is a question from Robert Wachter. Hi, Robert. Um, so this is to Hyona. And the question is, Hyona, can you be more specific on the civil law procedures that you have in mind? Um, and how might this be introduced? Um, is it by the council or is it by the tribunal? So I think those two questions are directly, directly go to your presentation. And um, I think it goes, and the two are linked. So I'll give you a chance on answering both of them. Okay, thank you, Sue. And thank you for the questions um, from the participants. Um, as for the first question, if I correct, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, the Korean parties um, uh, tend to uh, perceive the um, international arbitration procedure more of a um, common law system than a civil law system. So if there is a Korean party uh, who does not have uh, much experience with international arbitration, then my first job would be to explain the difference uh, between the um, international arbitration procedure and the Korean court litigation proceedings. And there are some uh, uh, some uh, differences that I need to kind of persuade, uh, uh, make them understand, since they are not quite um, familiar with um, common law system. So I think the Korean parties uh, recognize that there is uh, uh, some differences uh, between the um, international arbitration proceedings and the, um, the Korean court uh, litigation uh, proceedings. And as for the um, second question, I think, um, um, sorry, could you repeat uh, the jinx of the second question? I'm sorry, Sue. So during your presentation, uh, you had mentioned that there are some civil law procedures mm -hmm. um, that might be introduced into the international arbitration process. Um, what, what are the specific procedures and how they might might they be introduced? Is it more from oh, okay. the initiative of the council or the tribunal? Okay, well, sorry, uh, that would uh, be uh, uh, mainly the, the early involvement of the tribunal for the case and the early dialogue of uh, the parties and the tribunal on the um, substantive issues. That would be my uh, first um, element of the civil system that needs to be uh, more um, incorporated uh, and reflected into uh, the um, international arbitration proceedings. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, thank you for that. Um, we have another question. We actually have a number of questions, but one that comes to to my um, to catches my eyes is the one uh, from. Um, is a one related to common lawyers acceptance of inquisitorial approach. Um, I don't know the name of the, the person who posed this question, but it goes like this. Um, common lawyers often frown upon and perhaps dislike inquisitorial approach. Um, if that's the case, then how do you engage them on the inquisitorial process? I think this might be a question um, that we would it would be good if we had a an arbitrator with a civil law uh, background and who uses a lot of the inquisitorial mode. Uh, but since we don't have, I mean, we I know both Hyona and um, and um, Sophie are as act, are active as arbitrators, um, but I don't know how many of the the councils have been of of common law background. Um, maybe I should ask this question to both Stephen for as your uh, with your approach or experience sitting with other arbitrators, um, and also I'll ask and, and I'll also give Sophie a chance to answer this because you do come from a civil law background. So why don't I let let you Stephen take this question? Right. Um, thank you, Sue. Well, it, I think it, 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 this is an answer. This is a question that one has to answer, I think, sort of like, you know, looking at, at, at the particulars of, 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 of the, uh, the individuals before you. It's a bit of a broad brush question that common lawyers often front upon and dislike the inquisitorial approach. I mean, I, as I said, actually, I am a common lawyer. <laughs> and, uh, I've not been trained in the civil law in any way, although I, I practice in, in Asia, which is mostly a civil law world. And uh, I see the, the advantages of an inquisitorial approach, although I, I, would, I know that there, there may be others 
who was certainly frowned upon it and say that you know, find it a very unusual process uh, to take it. I think it is possible um, to persuade council to adopt different processes. Uh, I have had some success uh, with this as an arbitrator, not perhaps with, with a fully inquisitorial uh, approach, but with some aspects of, of what it may be different from, from the uh, common law of practice. And, and one of these things is actually the introduction of witness evidence and the use of witness evidence in, in international arbitration. The common law approach and with the common law approach of court is that one would file their statements of case uh, and the witness statements would come much later. And the witness statements are really intended to sort of wrap everything up, um, go over the ground in the, in the statements of case. Uh, and the witness statement, at least in, in English court procedure and Singapore court procedure, um, would be the substantive place where even you know, the lawyers would introduce some of the legal arguments into it because that's just the way the procedure is. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily the, the best way it's done, but that's the way it's developed. And when, and I tend to, my approach in international arbitration tends to be that I think we, it would be more effective actually to have the witness statements accompany the statements of case where they're filed. And if there's no need for a witness statement, then don't put in the witness statement if, if all the assertions are adequately uh, dealt with by documents. Now, I've had to deal sometimes with persuading common lawyers who are not too familiar with this process, with adopting this process. And I think I've had some success um, because I explained to them the reason why we're doing it. Then they get it and actually they see the sense of it and they agree to it. So I haven't as yet, as arbitrator, tried to persuade common lawyers to adopt an inquisitorial process. The times I've done it is to uh, get civil lawyers to agree to it. Um, maybe the day will come when I will try and do that <laughs> in, in an appropriate case. Uh, and I, I think it might be possible, you know, if there's a compelling reason why that procedure has to be adopted and, and one can articulate the reasons to counsel, I think there's a possibility of actually getting them to, uh, to do that. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Stephen, for that. And, and Sophie, would you like to take you, you to give your ideas, your views on that point? Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, like Stephen, I have not ever persuaded the common law lawyers to, um, to take the inquisitorial approach. But uh, from, um, from my experience, a part of an ele some elements of inquisitorial procedure can be very uh, persuasive even to the common law lawyers. For example, uh, even some are the English barrister, like the concept of early and frequent case management. So there are some elements which can be um, easily taken by the, English, uh, the common law lawyers. So I think we have to start from that point and then uh, we have to uh, persuade them by explaining the reasons, as Stephen said. And if the common law lawyers reviews or considers that approach, and they, if they find that the procedure will be more efficient by taking that approach, then I think they will agree, agree with the, uh, the taking the, the inquisitorial approach. And in case that even even though we per se try to persuade the common law lawyers to by explaining the reasons and but they do not still they do not like the inquisitorial approach then uh, I think the party autonomy comes first so in that case we have to give up the efficient procedure and to serve the party autonomy and, uh, and that's my thought. Thank you. I think that that really um, is is um, in line with um, the experience that many of us have in, in in the field of international arbitration. I mean, nobody can be insisting on their own own ways. Everybody has to give in something. Um, and I, I think there we have one more question, and we have more questions. But for the interest of time, I don't think we can leave without asking Samar an additional question. So this is this is one for you. And I think uh, and if 
to paraphrase the question, um, uh, and this is from Pratik Sival, and um, to paraphrase the question, it goes like this. Due to the ease of interaction in CMCs as a real result of reliance on technology, uh, do you expect that the English system, or I guess the common law system, to, um, to pivot more towards the inquisitorial type of, of, of system? Um, I, I think I have a d definitional issue with the premise of the question in that uh, uh, the, the assumption that uh, more, more frequent hearings are definitionally inquisitorial and an anathema to common law, uh, the common law system, I perhaps don't accept it. But, but I do, I, I think I do agree with the rest of the question, which is I think uh, it does give us an opportunity uh, to be more flexible than perhaps we've been in the past. Um, and it does give us more opportunities to engage more frequently uh, than we, we have tended to do. And I think that's, uh, that's part of what I said in my presentation is, you know, we should question the, the assumptions uh, which have led us to where we are. And as I say, you know, where we are is not a bad place necessarily. I think it does work for a large enough number of people frequently enough, but uh, it does give us an opportunity to say, well, can we do things differently? And I think, I think we will, uh, I think we will. Okay, so thank you for that. And I, I think we've already reached or actually passed the, the end time or expected scheduled uh, time for our webinar. And I guess I should conclude by thanking all the speakers for joining us and also for the attendees. And one very last message. Um, I would like to invite everybody to our, our um, of course, our next KCAB and Friends webinar series, but also before our next KCAB and, um, and um, Friends webinar series, next week, uh, the KCAB will be hosting the Soul ADR Festival Week. And during the week, we'll have various events by our, um, by many of our, our partnering institutions and groups and um, law firms. And of, of the various arbitration um, events on Thursday and Friday, starting from four to seven, we will be having our uh, ninth Asia Pacific ADR conference, which is our flagship or KCB International's flagship conference. And we will have a very interesting group of panelists discussing all the hot topics of international arbitration. You can um, find more information in our website or Google us up and you'll see a more specific um, programs and speaker lineup of the program. So um, thank you all for staying on late. Um, I hope to see you again in the next uh, KCAB and Friends webinar series and uh, or if or earlier to during the Seoul ADR festival. So thank you all. Stay, stay safe and see you again. Bye-bye.